Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen here with Daniel Mangana. Today is Thursday, August the 20th, 2020. It's 4 p.m. New York time, wherever you are in the world. Thanks for joining us for another episode of LOA Today, your daily dose of happy. And a little shout out to our friend Alex King, who uh, has not been able to join us for a few days now, but uh, she's been through uh, some interesting stuff. She was supposed to get uh, some surgery. And I don't know if you heard about this, Daniel, but Rita last Friday gave her a little reading on a qu- couple questions. And one of the things Rita told her was get a, a second opinion. She got the second opinion. And found out that she had a punctured lung that she didn't know about. I mean, <laughs> this was like a get out of town kind of thing. Uh, that's a get out of town, get out of the state, get out of the country and off the planet. Really? That's what that is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But she's resting and she's she's recovering. And the whole thing got turned on its side, basically. She got that second opinion. And, you know, so... Love and, and joy going out to you, Alex, and, and boy, just yeah. on the healing path. Yeah, definitely. She's been posting some really beautiful pictures of her view and still keeping us updated with the best TV shows. So big love to you, Alex. <laughs> I love it. I yeah. love it. That's yeah. Alex Oliver. Too. She's, she's like, I'm bored. Da, 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 da. It's like, <laughs> it's like, I'm so happy that in your boredom, you're keeping us entertained. That is great. Do it for the team, girlie. No kidding. Yeah. But I mean, it's just, it's, it's just an amazing thing. First of all, it it gave Rita some serious validation because I mean, you know, what did Rita know? All she knows is what she's getting. She passes some information along Mm -hmm. and it turns out to be dead on, you know, just absolutely perfect. And megaly supportive. Yeah. Very supportive. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. all right. Good stuff there. Well, uh, last week we were talking about, was it last week? Yeah. I think last week we were talking about the money game. And we've had a few people, uh, listeners who said, yep, I'm going to play along with you. Uh, we actually have mm-hmm. a couple weeks ago, um, some wins. Last 10 days or so, we had a couple of people who had some wins at halfway win, a part of a $5 bill. That was pretty wild. <laughs> yep. Um, but I wanted to kind of go a little bit further, kind of like as if we were doing one of your groups and you were doing some coaching mm-hmm. for people and so forth. Um, and I don't have a whole lot to work with here. It's not like I've had input from listeners saying this is what's going on beyond what I've told you. So mm-hmm, I'll, I'll tell you what's going on with me, and then we'll just kind of infer some other stuff that could be happening. Yeah, and maybe maybe running. some people are going to tune in live and let us know what's going yeah, on. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, let people know, let us know what, what's going on with them trying out the money game. And so I'll just tell you point blank. I my my first set uh, figure number that I picked was ten bucks. I said, okay, I'll, I'll do ten bucks. I did the thing, wrote it out on the uh, piece of paper, mm-hmm. wrote out my five things that I was feeling grateful for and really felt them and so forth, and then folded it up and. I was done with it. I was gone, and nothing's happened. <laughs> when when did when did that happen? When did you? That do was it? Uh, let's see. When was that? That was over the weekend, I think, on Sunday. Yeah, mm-hmm. so it was like you know, four or five days ago. So not real far, you know, not real long. But so, who says it has to have happened yet? I don't know. I just Mate. it's a starting point for a conversation. Is all I can. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing as well to note is that you've had some pretty big wins. So it's okay. possible that the universe is gearing up to give you a, a big old win. That would be cool, which actually leads into a second topic I was going to bring in. Okay. And that may end up being the topic for the day. Okay. This also comes originally through Rita. Mm-hmm. Because last Friday, in the midst of the show, Rita interrupted me. I had like you know, 12 or 13, 14 different questions from listeners. In the middle of it, she <laughs> stops and turns to me and says, this is for you, Walt. I said, okay. Mm-hmm. It's like Cindy said to me yesterday, what's coming? <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, oh, my God, should I be braced? <laughs> yeah. But she said, you should have your own radio station. I said, well, that sounds cool. I like that idea a lot. I, mm-hmm. I don't really have the money for it, but, hey, I'm open to it. Send it to me. I- I'm cool, you know. And I was so kind of taken off guard by the whole thing i didn't really know how to react you know i wasn't Mm -hmm. i was expecting to be doing listener questions Mm -hmm. but it got me thinking and over the next few days i thought well that would really be cool to have either you know like a a radio station or or a tv show or you know something like that give us more Mm -hmm. exposure to a large audience yeah that would be really great um none of it is anything i would have any clue how to go about doing and mm-hmm. you know, we're always taught, you know, don't worry about how stuff works. Well, this is a case where I can very easily not worry about how st- stuff works because I haven't the faintest clue how this would work. So throw that one out the window. So this is this is purely a vibration, law of attraction, attracted somehow thing. And so I just wanted to toss it out and think, 
you know, well, this is a good thing to ask Daniel about. What would you do if you were in my shoes on this? I was actually um, obsessed with starting up a radio station about two years ago. I did all the research on how it would work and how it would fund itself. Really? So I've actually got pretty much the components of it. So I had this real big fire and I, I do my best of following the nudges when I get them. And I really got into it and I did the research and I mapped it out. So what it would cost, how much I'd need to get it started. And then I was like, yeah, okay. It felt like it had reached its completion. And generally speaking, as I'm a dynamo genius, that's my, um, my wealth dynamic type. I'm great at coming up with the idea and getting it started. And generally what happens is the right person comes in to sort of carry on the project. And so uh-huh. I sort of, I just shelf it and wait till then. So I can take a look and see, um, in my files. But I've got everything done. There are basically okay. services that allow you to do digital things. And you can have like music DJs on there, whatever, and blah, blah, blah. And it's really quite manageable to do. Okay. Um, interesting. I, I guess what I was thinking is I want to have a – I've long wanted to have a – Network slash channel slash station slash whatever you want to call it, all devoted to the broader topic that I generally call law of attraction, but really it's just about connecting to source energy and, and all the, the topics that are around that. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, right now we do LOA today, your daily dose of happy, and we've been doing that for quite some time and it's great. And I have lots of different voices on it and I, I'm enjoying that a lot. But I also have this longer term vision of like, well, wouldn't it be great if we could also start bringing in um, you know, producers and writers and directors to create fiction shows and to, you know, expand the universe, so to speak. You know, you have a whole bunch of the secret type stuff going on. Or, you and know, music DJs can do like ecstatic dance sessions. Yeah, all kinds of stuff like that. Visualizations you know, like this, this and whole healing. range of things like that, you know? So and it, now that requires a lot of creative talent a whole lot of creative talent because we're not talking about being able to just reach into, you know, the top 40 and grab their stuff. It it doesn't quite apply to what we had in mind or what I had in mind. Anyway, it means reaching and finding the people who are first of all, in alignment with the kind of thing we're talking about. And second of all, willing to create. And third of all, we we somehow figure out a way to fund all of this thing. It's a lot. Most of that I've already sort of got on some kind of idea map and plan. (laughs) <laughs> on my computer somewhere. So, it's actually a pretty nifty business model that you can use to make it work. But really? We'll talk about that offline. Yeah. All right. Okay. But that's, it's, it's not as cumbersome as maybe it is in your head. You just need okay. one executive producer for the station. Yeah, that's, who would then have neat. sub, sub producers for different types of talent. Mm hmm. And then it's engineers to sort of do the back and forth, but a lot of the services actually do the engineering. So it's really just about administrators to bounce things back and forth. And you can get those for five or six bucks an hour. So it's actually not as capital intensive as you might think. What money is going to go into is promoting the shows, promoting the channels, um, building up listenership. That's where the resources would be going to Uh, actually the channel itself. Not that bad. Well, are we t- what kind of channel are we, are we talking about? What Rita was talking about and what I was uh, talking about was a an on the air, an airwaves type channel. Not just nobody's listening to that anymore. The listening, the listenership for that's going down. Everyone's diverting to digital and getting stuff on their phones now. Well, specifically, can- I was thinking satellite because people are listening in their cars. Uh, but you can do the digital radio that they can pick up the D. DAB, DA, DAB, digital something broadcast, so they can pick it up on their cars too. Okay, I don't know about that one, so that that one's good to know about then. Yeah, so yeah, D- D- DAB, DAB, digital radio is non-analog, and you can go from online stream directly into analog, just uh, just strictly into the the DAB channels, just like they do the DAB into online radio. Okay, well, I don't think anybody does analog radio anymore, but yeah, I understand what you mean. Yeah, you, yeah. you know what I mean. So like the radio show that I was on for, oh God, how long did I have my radio show for? I don't remember. But it streamed live on the terrestrial radio. Right. And then also at the same time was online. Okay. So they and both, people yeah. could also tune That's in cool. on, their, on their cars. So yeah. it, there basically, there was 
anyway, we'll. I'll... Well, cool. So we'll talk about that offline. But now there's an example. Yeah. I mean, I had no idea how to make anything like that happen. I ra- raised the question to you, and all of a sudden, you've got all this information you- that you're pouring out. Like, whoa, this is pretty cool stuff. <laughs> it's really doable. It's re- really, really, really doable. Like I said, I'd already, um, I've been obsessed with this before, and then I kind of eased off on it because the the next pieces didn't really come together, so I left it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, it's also part of, of a topic that I think has been needed to be discussed for quite some time, and that is we humans think about certain things as being big asks. Mm-hmm. Um, for most people, a big ask would be like, you know, I don't know, making a million dollars or buying a big home or, you know, something like that. Some Something that is larger than a symbol, <laughs> something that's pretty large size that the mm-hmm. uh, for for the person who's imagining it, it seems like it's outside of their comfort range. Let's put it that way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I I figured that becomes the topic that I had in mind for today. What what can we tell people about when you're trying to reach outside your comfort range? Don't don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it. It's like do you do do you want the exercise of reaching or do you want to get outside of your comfort range? That's the and and do you know what? I'm not knocking it. Some people are in it for the journey and they're not necessarily interested in getting somewhere. And if that's you, then <laughs> reach away, my friend. That's right. <laughs> but it's really a question of what do you really want? Do you want to do it or do you want to talk about going for it? Or do you want to have the sob story of failing it? You know, I, I never even considered that possibility, but you're right. That that could definitely be going on with any number of people. Sure. Mm-hmm. And there's no judgment on any of these things. It's about ownership and deciding, do you consciously desire this? Mm-hmm. And sometimes you're going to be all right with it. I was talking about the other day. I think it was on a group call. I was talking the other day. Um, I was, there was one evening this week. I was like, do you know what? I'm just going to eat some potato chips watch a bit of Netflix and have a Corona. I'm not going to do anything productive. (laughs) I even had some cheesecake as well. I didn't eat anything healthy. I just gave myself a couple of hours just to just let it all hang out. And it felt great. And then the next morning I got up early, did my meditation, did some breath work, did some yoga and got back to it. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. It's true. I mean, judgment doesn't come into it because it's it's about preference. It's about what you like, what you don't like. And mm-hmm. that, that's what we're here to explore and to enjoy and to mm-hmm. um, have fun with. And uncover in some instances as well. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, that's kind of what happens. That, that's what the, the cycle of it is. Cindy and I were talking about this yesterday in conjunction with a Neville Goddard book that she found that we hadn't, we we thought we'd explored almost all of them, but we found another one. And Mm -hmm. he he brought up in this book, a concept. Now, Neville, I don't know if you know Neville's stuff very much. Yeah. Um, I've got his complete works. Okay. So Mm -hmm. um, have you uh, read any of his stuff about tithing? Yeah. I'm practice tithing diligently. I actually practice something called um, future tithing. Future tithing. Okay. Mm-hmm. You'll have to tell us I'll about let you speak. that. Is. I'll let you speak. All right. Well, <laughs> for me, it was a new Neville topic. We, uh, Cindy and I hadn't run into it before with him. Mm-hmm. And we loved the fact that he was treating it as an energetic thing rather than, you know, giving to your local church or something like that. Mm-hmm. That's um, how I treat it. And I don't remember what the exact phrase was from the book we were reading, but the general idea of it was you take one tenth of whatever it is that you have been desiring and feed it back into the system, so to speak. And you create, you create like a loop that just keeps mm-hmm. building and building energy kind of similar. We, we kind of equated it to somebody who uses a piece of a, of a, of a bread dough to, to create the new bread dough. And you know, mm-hmm. the bread just keeps getting passed along from one making to the next. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a really fascinating concept because what it's basically outlining is the idea that we do not have our asks as separate, disparate things that are all by themselves. Our asks are part of a, continu- a continuity of life that just keeps going on and on and on and on. And the mm-hmm. more that we understand that, the, 
I think the easier it is to not only grasp it, to, but also to apply it and to mm. make it part of our lives and make it part of our belief system. Because ultimately, I mean, that's what your money gain book, that's what most of the stuff we talk about is about, is building that belief system. And mm -hmm. the, I think the tithing part's a big part of it. But tell me about the future tithing. I hadn't heard that particular one before. So, I mean, I'm all about Nebby G's idea on, on tithing. Tithing is something I've practiced diligently for years. And there's a couple of angles on it from an energetic perspective also. When you're giving away a portion of something you receive, you're saying with certainty that I know this is in the end. There's more to come. Mm -hmm. I'm so abundant. I can give some of this away. Mm -hmm. Now I personally have some specific causes that I support. Uh, it's being more deeply formalized into the foundation that my brothers and sisters and I set up but at the moment. It's sort of like an ad hoc thing, but it's the energy of the giving and the certainty and faith within which we bless and give away that a anchors in our abundance because we're saying we're so abundant that a part of mm -hmm. it's in a way. And then just like Nebi G said, we're maintaining flow. We're showing the universe that we are participating in the flow and not hoarding and keeping in. Cause that's like a blood clot of energy of my mm -hmm. energy. So it's mm -hmm. almost like thinning the blood out and allowing it to flow, which allows us to, once we, we step consciously into that ecosystem of, of abundant flow, we're inviting more of it to come through us too. So that's that one. Have you ever heard me talk about value vacuums? Value vacuums. Nope. I can't think I, I can say that I've heard that one from you. Okay. So that one's something that I teach in my, um, my business coaching for people. Okay. And what we do is, um, we, so nature's all about expanding, right? And when an expansive gap occurs in our reality, the universe fills it in because nature abhors a vacuum. There's no vacuums. It, it instantly starts to get filled in first with the energy, then the thought form, and then it becomes a physical reality, right? So what we do with a valley vacuum is we deliberately create a va that vacuum in the universe we deliberately create a gap that the universe will fill in. So I deliberately create a gap. So, so be more specific. Give me an example. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to step into it. I'm going to step into it. I'm just oh, making sure we get it. Yeah, yeah. So what we do is in its simplest form, when I'm talking to business owners, we create gaps through completely heart centered service to others with no expectation of return. Okay. And then I think it's the law of uh, reciprocation that what we put out always comes back to us, but not necessarily from where we put it out to. Mm -hmm. So it could be that as a business owner, I go and spend time in my local soup kitchen, for example, giving my time and energy and serving with no expectation, not, not for a photo opportunity, not to be that just to give. Right. And what that does is that giving out creates a vacuum a vacuum through adding value to the world that the universe will fill in with more of what we are. So when we give without thinking about what's coming back and at the same time, hold the frequency of abundance because we multiply ourselves into that gap, abundance fills it up. New clients come into the business, clients give more, so on and so forth. So what we're doing with future tithing is we're effectively tithing in advance for what we know we're going to create. So, Okay. Let's say, for example, I'm working on creating an additional revenue stream for my business of $10,000 a month. Okay. That'd be a thousand dollars of tithe at 10%. Right. So I tithe in advance. Okay. So I give that thousand dollars away, mm -hmm. blessing it as if I'm tithing for what I've already received. So I give the tithe away before the universe gives me the abundance. And that creates a loop of certainty that calls in that abundance that I've already tithed. You know, as you're saying that, I realized I actually had original tithing backwards because I always thought of tithing in terms of what you just described. And I realized that's not the way p most people think of tithing, is it? No. Most people they think tithe of out of your, after your increase. Yeah. You tie that of your increase. In Islam, they use zakar, which is a 5%. Um, the Judeo Christian concept is from the, the, the Malchizedek's instructions to Abraham, which is to give 10% away. Mm -hmm. uh, most, most, 
entrepreneurs that I know of that are sort of operating under this kind of thing. They'll give 10%, 10% of shares into a charity or 10% of their, the guys that go hard to go home, like the Carnegie and the, the Rockefellers end up giving most of it away. I know that the Belinda and Melinda and Bill Gates are giving away a big chunk of theirs away. Mm-hmm. Um, but most people tithe after when you yeah, pre-tithe. Right. I thought of it that way, but you're right. Yeah. When you pre-tithe, you create a, a value vacuum. What's the, the experiential difference, do you think? You're doing it for what you haven't gotten yet. That's the ultimate expression of faith. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, let me ask the question differently. Does it play out differently when you do it in advance compared to when you do it after the fact? Well, if you haven't got it yet, you're actually creating the manifestation of it. You're anchoring in the manifestation physically. So let's say you set, let's say we use a flow final model. You set the intention, you get into the vibration of it, you get the feeling of it, you mentally rehearse it, and then you basically accelerate the receivership of it by saying, look, universe, I know this is coming anyway, so I'm just going to pop the 10% down now. It's an, it's a, it's an ex, it's a physical exercise of faith. Yes, I understand that. I guess what I'm asking myself in my mind and trying to ask and failing miserably here on the show. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm thinking in terms of what we talked about a moment ago, where you tithe in order to basically feed the next round. And so you have this constant flow going of uh, you're feeding it and getting. I back. would say that tithing in its, in its, in its pristine purity isn't doing it to get the next round. It's just doing it. Okay. So it's not with an intent. In terms of two, I was just thinking in terms of like, like a, a motor. I mean, once you get a motor started, it, it, it keeps itself going. It, it keeps going through the same steps over and over and over and over again. And mm-hmm. after you've gotten that, that past that first, uh, impulse that, mm-hmm. that it's the hardest part about starting the motor up from that point on, it's pretty easy. The motor can get it, keep itself going pretty easily. But the motor's already going. The motor of the universe is already going. We're stepping into the flow that already exists. Yeah. So we're not getting a motor going. The motor's already there. It's just waiting for us to step into the flow. Okay. So, so the, the difference here is, is the part about the motor getting started, but there's not really any difference in terms of what happens after the motor gets going. Okay. And that yeah. I can certainly see. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the other thing is for me, tithing after the fact is an expression of gratitude and thanks, right? Thankfulness. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, thank you. I'm adding back to the universe and the bounty, you know, the universe is expressed through this child. It's expressed through this charity. It's expressed through this homeless person, through this need, or, you know, whether it's through my time, through my money or whatever, I'm expressing, I'm physically saying look, this, I'm making a stance within myself. I'm physically, I'm making a physical apparition of my thanks and gratitude. But doing that in advance as a manifestation tool, because it hasn't happened yet. We're saying, I know this already exists non-physically. I'm claiming it and laying my stake with it physically. And I'm demonstrating my level of certainty by tithing in advance and then forgetting about it. And what's, what's making that make sense for me as a different way of looking at tithing, I guess. It doesn't seem different. That's I'm still stuck where I was before where I'm saying, well, isn't that the way it always works? And then, oh, no, no, that's not the way most people think of tithing. So <laughs> my, my whole mindset is backwards on this thing. <laughs> I adjust to that. <laughs> um, but I guess what I'm trying to say is this this is basically a way of just trying to get the whole thing going. It's it's a way of, of jump starting the routine. That's what that that's what I'm getting is Yeah, when you're future when you're future pacing you're jump starting the, the transition from non physical to physical. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. It's interesting. I, I I guess I hadn't really thought that there would be a difference in terms of jump starting, but I guess there is one. I, I'm I'm kind of stuck on it to be honest. Just because, I, I don't know, for me, it, it's all continuity. I, I don't really see a beginning point to any of it. It just kind of, I mean, we, we arbitrarily say, like, we start with the money game. Okay, I start with $10, but even that's a continuity thing for yeah, me. Yeah, it's a continuity. It's all continuity. Uh, but at yeah. the end of the day, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're almost, there's a timeline of continuity where we're receiving, and there's a timeline of continuity when we're in lack. Typing mm-hmm. in advance transitions us to the timeline where it's happening in continuity and it's there. Mm-hmm. We're simply aligning ourselves to that timeline of receivership and paying the, the fare to hop across the timeline. That's it. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. I hope I haven't confused listeners. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I think most people will probably have tithing down as something that's done after the fact, so we should be okay. Okay, good. <laughs> so if anybody out there is confused, I humbly apologize. Just you know, send your letters to Daniel because he'll be able to answer them better than me. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, well, that tithing concept was interesting, and I like the future tithing concept. That's also interesting. I especially like the way, though, that he was expressing it as an energetic thing. It wasn't, I mean, sure, money is, is a way of expressing energy, but I just like the fact that he was thinking about it as pure energy. Mm-hmm. And for me, anything that I can think of as pure energy is where I have the best connection, the best um, best understanding of what's going on. I actually, for, uh, believe it or not, I get more tripped up trying to connect the energy to the physical than I do about understanding the energy of it. To me, the energy of it makes total sense. Not just of, of you know, attracting something, but just how stuff works. When I first mm-hmm. heard Law of Attraction, it it all sounded like energy to me. And that's how I was able to make sense out of it. Mm-hmm. The only time I started to get confused is when I tried to apply it to physical. But up until mm. that point, just as pure energy, it was like, well, yeah, of course. How else could it be? <laughs> <laughs> what other options do we have? There yeah, are no other options. Is there another option here? <laughs> God. Hilarious. Yeah. It's it's funny how we all bring these different perspectives. That's mine. So mm. deal with it. But, right. But the thing is, I think the different perspectives that we all bring adds to the texture and tapestry of life, no? Sure. Oh, well, yeah. It's part I mean, and parcel of the party, I think. There would be no point to having perspectives without that. Mm-hmm. I don't think. I think it's all part of the party. Yeah. I, it's, I think it's one of the reasons I enjoy doing a podcast. Mm-hmm. Because of those perspectives. I'm, I, I've, I'm constantly learning something new because I'm seeing things and thinking about things from someone else's perspective. Mm-hmm. And then contrasting it with my own perspective, comparing it, saying, okay, this is where it's similar. This is where it's a little different. It's like, oh, yeah, hmm, I haven't thought of it that way. That That's fun. To me, that's where, that's life right there. I mean, I do it in the form of a podcast, but it's really, it doesn't matter whether you're doing it as a business, if you're doing it as a hobby, if you're doing whatever you're doing, you're, maybe you're raising a family, maybe you're out, you're, you're traveling, you're, you're skiing down a slope. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. If you're looking at it from various perspectives, it's so much more interesting, I think. Mm. In fact, I think that's I where, I, I think that's what makes contrast work. Hmm. I mean, contrast is one of those concepts that I think uh, I first heard about it from Abraham, but a lot of different teachers have taught it. And the first time mm-hmm. you hear about contrast, what do you focus on most often? I think most people focus on, well, here's the negative contrast, you know. The, the, the mm-hmm. negative part of the contrast, that's what I'm going to focus on because that's what it's all about because that's what I feel like I've, I've dealt with all my life and that's the hard part and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But for me, the contrast is the contrast in perspectives, different viewpoints. I think, I think what you've done is you've actually taken contrast out of having this limited view and you just say so contrast is just contrast. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way of saying it. <laughs> contrast is just contrast. The contrast could look this way, it could look that way, but contrast is just contrast. Yeah. It's 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 duality and polarity they've manifested in experience. And it's an unavoidable aspect of a dual of a dual reality. <laughs> so when people are having these contrast contrasting points, it doesn't mean that everything has to go wrong, it doesn't mean that everything has to be painful, but it does mean that there will be a dual experience. Uh I remember when I was um I studied economics is what I studied. And when you talk about, we study about dualism and, you know, rich and poor and everyone's like, yeah, we need to fix poverty and, you know, down with the cabal. There has always been dualism. It's true. There has always been haves and haves nots, rich and poor, weak and strong. It's part and parcel of the dual nature of our reality. Mm -hmm. What it doesn't mean is that one has to be disempowered by their experience as being one on one side of the of that contrast or that one has to be negatively um uh, emotionally impacted by it and that's where the zooming out thing that i think the stream talks about for me that's where it really comes in it's 
zooming out to see that although this contrast is happening, it doesn't have to affect my ability to continue to create. And I can accept and witness that experience as part of the journey of being human. Not I have to reestablish a balance and try and force it to change because I'm not okay with the contrast. Right. Yeah. Well, that's my, that's my thing anyway. No, I agree with you. I think you're, I think you got it. And the fact is that we do get wrapped up in contrast. We do Mm -hmm. get, um, and by wrapped up, I mean like tripped up on it. Mm -hmm. We trip up often on contrast. I don't know. Maybe it's just, I think you nailed it. I, I don't think about it the way most people do. I think about it just as contrast. It's just, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. And I think I do that just because it's, it's just easier to think about it that way. Mm-hmm. I actually get confused by people who want to treat contrast as just the one end of it. Mm-hmm. I do entire episodes on it and I'll try to play their point, but I still get confused by it. <laughs> It's one of the reasons I come up with all these wild questions when I'm when I'm asking or interviewing somebody because I'm I'm constantly playing with okay well I've heard this person say that I'll I'll bring that in and see what see what kind of answer I get out of that. <laughs> <laughs> but to me, contrast is simple. It's the simplest mm-hmm. thing in in existence, and I I think that so many teachers and spiritual leaders and so forth have actually made the whole thing more difficult with lessons like, well, you can't have light without darkness. You can't have, you know, they'll, they'll do the extreme stuff, right? You got to have, well, you can't have night without day. You can't have, you know, they'll, they'll just fill in the blank with all these, these opposites. And I think to myself, mm-hmm. why are you doing that? I mean, well, yeah, sure. But what does that actually tell you about contrast? It mm-hmm. simply tells you, well, there's one end and there's another end. Yeah. What else? Well, I don't know. That's about all it tells me. <laughs> <laughs> it's so limiting. It's so <laughs> limiting. It's just, well, it's black and white. Okay. Mm-hmm. So where does gray come from? <laughs> That's what I feel like saying. Like, where's the gray in your thought process? There doesn't seem to be any. <laughs> You know what? Um, I think what we're really, really, really being blessed with the opportunity to do personally is to write our own stories about what these things are. About what? Write our own stories about what these things are and what they mean to us. What what they are, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Whether we're talking about the different aspects or expressions of contrast, Mm. whether we're talking about duality and even the law of attraction itself. I think part and parcel of the big shakeup that's being witnessed for many, not for all, but for many, is this breakdown in being forced to see things in a certain way, in a certain light, and through certain certain rules. I think some people take that off the deep end and uh, against that backdrop are like, well, <laughs> I'm going to have the new earth. I, I reject money. Okay, but we haven't broken that agreement yet. So (laughs) you still have to pay the rent and your credit card bills. Um, So there's, there's, there is, there is a, there's a balance, I think, to it. But I think there's a freedom to be had. And even go back to your point earlier about people that want to sort of jump and leap. Or you could look at the new heights available and step to it and enjoy the journey and savor the experience of making your way there with its contrast, with its textures, with its new lessons, with new people and all of its goodness, because that's what life's about anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's true that it's a good way to understand the whole idea of life's a journey thing, that that concept. Um, Mm. I think it's one of the values of of your um, micro shifting concept. It's a way of basically Mm -hmm. stepping through things and, and when you're stepping, you are journeying. That's just part yeah. of what's going on. Part and parcel of it. Yeah. They're trying to just do it all in one great big gulp. It's like, it's, it's kind of like the analogy that the little story that uh, Esther Hicks tells in the voice of Abraham. A- Abraham says there was at one point where Esther and Jerry were going to take a river raft trip. Mm-hmm. And Abraham was trying to explain to somebody who was in the hot seat what the purpose of a journey was. Why, why do you do the journey? 
And Abraham says, well, what they could have done is they could have gone up to the director of the river raft trip and said, can't you just take us down to where we're going to be finished off and just paddle us upstream for about 200 yards and then we'll just ride the last 200 yards and we'll be done with it? Mm -hmm. And the guide said, well, yeah, I could do that, but I thought you wanted to take a river raft trip. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the point's obvious when you look at the story that way. Yeah. That you don't do it just for the end result. Mm -hmm. You don't just aim for the end result. You do it so you can ride the rapid. And do you know what? My only caveat to that is maybe that's what you're here to do on this time, to try and see what it's like trying to skip the whole thing and notice how pointless it is. Maybe that's what you're here to do this time. Absolutely, um, that's true. And there's, and, there's, and there's no judgment either way. But I suppose what people like yourself and myself and those of us who are out there showing the other way of doing it is uh, giving people the opportunity to see that there's something to be had in enjoying the River Raft trip. And not only enjoying it, but enjoying it even in the parts that are not quite as much fun, which is yeah. a real challenge. Yeah. Being okay with the, the messiness that yeah. may appear and be experienced sometimes yeah. and just being okay with all of it as just being part of the journey uh, and a journey that can actually be pretty bloody groovy. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's challenging. I yeah. won't claim that it isn't. It can be mm -hmm. quite challenging. I mean, there are times where I grip my teeth and I say, what the... Yeah, yeah, what the... No yeah, problem. right. <laughs> Thank you. But even that's part of the journey. Mm -hmm. It All of it is. I think one of the great messages from the stream, like you were talking about, is that pullback message. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great, not just because it's a good idea, but because... It's a way, from my perspective, of describing what the journey is like. For me, the journey is, part of that journey is learning to step back and, and going through the process of stepping back and experiencing what happens as I step back and seeing what changes in my perspective as I step back. It, it, isn't, just, it isn't the final place of I've stepped all the way back. It's what's happening during the stepping back. Because as, as I go on in life, as I... As I experience new things, and each step of the way, I take a little bit more of a step back, a little bit more of a step back, a little bit more of a step back. The whole story shifts, mm. changes, and it changes before my eyes. Now, that's kind of hard to describe what that's like, mm. unless you're consciously doing it. If you're consciously doing it, you know exactly what we're talking about here. But if you, yeah. if you aren't consciously doing that, that's a little hard to describe, other, other than to say, it's like watching your life unfold while you're living your life. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's watching your life unfold while you're living your life. It's doing but that's both the be, same being time. the observer and the experiencer at the same time. Exactly. Yes. That's the way to say it. Yeah. It's experiencing it and observing it simultaneously. Hmm. And it's cool. I'd agree. It's really cool. <laughs> Hundred percent agree. Sure. I think um, in in reality transurfing, it's basically staying. It's called staying in the center screen. The so the center. outer screen, yeah. So the outer screen is um, what's happening outside, external inputs, and the inner screen is what's going on in internally, like with your inner your inner um, emotional state, your inner thoughts, and all that kind of stuff that's going on the inside. When we're in the center screen. We're sitting in that balance between the two. Oh, okay. Witnessing both of them. So yeah, yeah that, that idea is called staying in the center screen. That's what they call it in reality turn surfing. Oh, okay. I learned something new. See, another reason we're doing the podcast. I learned something new. <laughs> the center screen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool stuff. Well, I don't know how we're doing in terms of helping people with the money game, but this has been cool so far. Let, let's go back. <laughs> moment. I, I'm going to kind of tr dream up scenarios with the money game. Yeah. I mean, we, we did talk about a couple of them that people have actually experienced. There was the person with the torn $5 bill mm -hmm. and you pointed out that the thing to do is to treat it as if it were the real spendable thing and to celebrate yeah. it and mm -hmm. just, you know, energetically. And in terms of, in terms of um, future tithing for that person, I'd give $5 away to someone. Mm -hmm. I'd bless $5 and give it away to someone. Mm -hmm. the That's what I personally would the blessing part, you kind of threw that in there, but that sounds like that's fairly important to you. 
Yeah, it's um, just basically the energy within which you're giving it away. Not, oh my God, I'm giving this away. I better get something back. Oh my God, yeah. I haven't even got the money yet. But the space that you're in as you give it to someone else should be giving in love. Yep. And when it's to add to their life, maybe giving it to a homeless person or even getting them a meal. I personally tend not to give cash to homeless people. I'm more like, hey, are you hungry? Let's go and get something to eat. I um, got into a lot of trouble with an ex for doing that once. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, do something like that. That'd be great to keep the energy moving, kickstart the engine. I can't remember who it was. There was somebody, I think it was here in Connecticut. And I don't remember who it was. They made an arrangement with one of the local chains, chain restaurants. And I think they had like tickets printed up or something like that. So they basically gave a bunch of money to the restaurant. The restaurant uh, authenticated these tickets and they hand out the tickets and the tickets were worth like $5, $10 worth of food. So that he oh, wow. gave $5 worth of food to anybody he saw on the street, but it was only redeemable if you went to the restaurant. That's amazing. I mean, that was a clever idea. I like that. Yeah. I really, really like that. I'm going to make a note. Because that way they can't go off and spend it on drugs or something else. They have to actually get it, get food with it. There was actually a funny, a really, really funny thing that happened once. Um, The guy I grew up with, Justin, he's a, um, he's a music artist in the UK. And what he did was uh, he and I met up once and there was a homeless woman and we'd said, you know, well, would take her and get something to eat she goes no i don't need something to eat uh let's go to this the supermarket and she was trying to get stuff that she could sell it was so blatant what she was doing she was she was trying to get stuff that she'd be able to then go off and sell um it didn't work suffice to say it it didn't it didn't it didn't work we're like no, you're gonna get some food okay you're gonna get some food love so anyway <laughs> Actually, that's another interesting thing that we can bring into the conversation. I mean, it doesn't really fit the traditional money game mentality, perhaps. But that woman was trying to play her own version of the money game. It was not. She was just trying to get money for drugs. She was trying to get money for drugs. (laughs) Is what I think she was trying to do. (laughs) She was was trying to attract money. It was kind of a backward way to go. That's what she was trying to do. Yeah. I mean, I think this is where, uh, for me, the difference between the Wallace D. Wattles competitive and creative plane comes in. Are you familiar with the difference between the two? I'm not, the terminology is throwing me, so I'm waiting for you to, to define. Okay. So, so Wallace D. Wattles wrote the book, The Science of Getting Rich. Right. And, um, in it, he said that there are two planes from which we manifest wealth and abundance, okay. All right. the competitive plane and the creative plane. Oh, um, okay. Right. And it, reality transurfing, the difference is inner intention and outer intention. And the competitive plane is using your will, you're pushing, you're right. getting out and doing, you're going for it, you're making it happen. You're, you know, you're maybe there's going to be some sneaky behavior in there, like our friend who wanted to get some premium hair products. Like, dude, you don't need a $50 <laughs> shampoo. This is literally what you try to do. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, Dude, I, I, I don't think that's your brand. Anyway, um, so that's, that's competitive play. The creative plane is using universal law, using meta power. If we're talking about reality chance, I think sure. using flow, creating from the heart versus pushing and doing. Right. So, um, both of them can be quite successful. And yeah. this is, I think, I think something that, they, well, Some the people lose sight of. Throw you off. I mean, I I tried to do the, the the first one, the competitive flow, for the longest time and failed it, miserably. You, and you'll burn out. Yeah, and you'll burn out. And and the thing is that there are laws for the workings of both. There are laws on how to operate effectively in the competitive plane and to do so successfully. But it's not as fun, mm. right? And it's not as flow as using the creative plane. No doubt about it. You can it. experience I'll, a, I'll a lot more fulfillment. Because what I tried it. to do, when I tried to do the competitive one, I wouldn't, I, I was unwilling to go outside of ethics, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. I, I, I wouldn't do anything that was even slightly unethical. 
And so I wanted it all to happen within me being competitive, but I would do everything by the book. Yeah, you know? but this is the thing. If you're going to go for the creative plane, then you're basically looking at the carnal experience. The carnal experience doesn't have the same moral boundaries and so you're actually well, cutting this, yourself off right. oh yeah this, this is, is the competitive plane is my point yeah you're that's what i'm saying but it, when you're doing the competitive plane but you're not leaving all bets off you're cutting yourself off from the competitive flow right exactly. it's very very counterintuitive exactly um, and, and that's why thing, i failed that's why it didn't work out and you've got as well you know um and again looking at this whole thing of non-judgment that everything has a purpose and has and serves there are those who add value to the world through the competitive plane. If you look at John D. Rockefeller mm-hmm. and how ruthless he was. Oh, he was. Mm-hmm. Ruthless. I watched a really great documentary on... Yeah, he um, had no roof. The, 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 <laughs> the, the forefathers of American industry, Vanderbilt, Rockefeller, Carnegie was... The stories that you get about the what he was doing to his, it was not. He, he was pretty nasty. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he at, talk about duality. He had like two entirely different sides to himself. <laughs> and then you even look at Edison and did you, if you look at what he did oh, to God. Tesla. Oh God. Yes. Ugh. Right. But look at what we've got in the world as a result. Yeah. I saw a thing the other day. Um, pretty communist. If you ask me, all billionaires are evil. We don't get that term on here very often. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All billionaires are evil. Look at them. If Jeff Bezos gave away 70 billion, he'd still have 10 billion. That's enough. He's greedy. Let's tax oh, him. Right, yeah. Like Jeff Bezos is not sitting on 70 billion. His shares might be worth that, but that's unrealized gains. And the fact mm-hmm. is, if Jeff Bezos sold all of his shares in order to realize the money to pay that then all of the ordinary men and women who have their money in their pension funds would take a beating because he makes up what five percent of the of the dow jones and if he decided to sort of sell that off you'd have a big dump and then there'd be the knock-on effect right but you know going back to these guys like people start saying oh yeah but jeff bezos was that do you think america would have been able to survive covid without amazon not really. Well, I'm not sure that we have yet, but that's another stu- subject. But, we're not quite there yet. Yeah, but yeah, but but I'm saying is, yeah, but look at the people that he's got. That it's duality, it's the yeah. contrast. Yeah, and the and the just as the the dark side to that contrast has pain, the positive side of it also has uplift. Even when you look at what's happening in the Middle East right now, mm-hmm. Saddam Hussein, by all accounts, wasn't doing very nice things to the Kurdish people. Not really, no. But he had an iron fist that kept that entire region together. It's all gone to pants now. That's true. And, you know, this, I think when we start to go down this direction, we, we run the risk of being called ruthless and so on and so forth. But sometimes in this contrast, the dark acts of people do actually create upside for others. People start blasting Trump. And they're going for the, what's the other guy? Biden. Mm -hmm. So under Trump, you've got economic, economically, things are better than they were under the last administration, but the moral decay is the, is the cost of it. Under Biden. The economics have also uh, declined since COVID. Yeah, but, but that wasn't his fault. You know, I'm saying in terms of Trump's fault. And then you look at Biden, you look at the economic policies that they put are planning to put, bring into place. I'm like, well, that's a disaster, especially if you bring it after <laughs> COVID, but then morally in terms of what they, they're, and I'm not speaking on the politics of it, but the, the moral claims that are made differ greatly from, from the other side, but both of them have got contrast. There's lots of contrast. <laughs> yeah. Both of them have got contrast. And, and, and both sides will make arguments that are supportive of, their view of how to apply contrast and or both of them have their views on things that support the people that are going to vote for them that's true absolutely it's like donald trump knows that his most of his voters don't really give a damn about certain things and so he's not going to speak on it it's as simple as simple as that or he's going to speak on it from a voice that speaks to his his base it's simple maths on it right it's not it's not not rocket science. These people are going to vote for me. These people are never going to vote for me. If they're even going to vote, I don't really care about them because they don't 
add to me in any way. Which he's so had I'm actually touch made, made abundantly clear that he doesn't care about them. It's very it's, it's <laughs> contrast. We have major contrast going on there. Even when you look at George Bush, when there was the whole thing about um, the the New Orleans, uh, everything that went down in New Orleans, and you know Kanye West said, you know George Bush doesn't like black people. They weren't going to vote for him, so <laughs> there was no upside for him turning his back on his base in order to support people. And again, that's the contrast of the experience. And I'm not into politics, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the dualism that exists here means that everybody's got plus side, everyone's got minus. It's about finding, I think people should speak to, should speak to their own contrast and what supports what they're looking to add to the world, not for themselves, but to the world. Um, but you know, making these summary judgments about what's good and what's bad, the competitive, the creative, we're better served having an honest look at what things look like and how we can, how we can set ourselves up to be able to manifest a kick-ass life regardless of who's in power, regardless of whether we have COVID or not, regardless if the people around us are competitive or creative. That's where true agency is, I think, regardless of who's in the seat of quote-unquote power, I have my own power that I'm exercising to manifest. I agree with that completely. And in fact, uh, I, I've documented often here on the show, I have this rather twisted side. I like to follow politics. I, my degrees. <laughs> <in politics. laughs> you know, but not because I, I think that there's anything great in it. I, t- to the contrary, I don't think there's anything in it that I really want to have. It's just, <laughs> you watch what the, the stream said it very nicely. The stream said, what's happening is we're watching the decline of politics. We're watching the decline of government. And that mm-hmm. is true. Mm-hmm. I've believed that since I was in my early twenties. And mm-hmm. it's fascinating. Mm-hmm. It, it's fascinating to me. I, this is the closest I've ever been able to come to people who like stock car racing. I've never liked stock car racing, but there are many people who like stock car racing and a large number of them like stock car racing because they like watching car crashes. Mm-hmm. And this is the same kind of thing. I, I, I kind of wonder sometimes, <laughs> am I morally flawed because I like watching the government falling apart? <laughs> or maybe there's just a cheeky dark side to you. But did you say you were lib- liber- liber- libertarian? Is it liber- yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I really don't count myself that way anymore. But yes, that was that's where I was at before. And a libertarian basically wants to have as little government as possible. So in that, yeah, sense, I think I'd probably be in that camp yeah. myself. You know, it's just community based governance, yeah, centered in love and healthy, loving boundaries is what I personally. Right. Think. I, I think ultimately we reach a point where we find that we don't even think in terms of government anymore. Yeah, it just kind of disappears as a concept. We're we're not anywhere near there right now, but I think that's ultimately where we end up. Yeah, I think ultimately, when you look at the, I mean, I studied politics, philosophy, and economics, right? So right. Yeah. I'm with you on that one. It's um that government was, if we look at the, the the Roman model, it was the people coming together to ensure that their needs were met and that everybody benefited. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And then plutocracy, plutocracy, is it plutocracy? Plutocracy. What's the word I'm looking at? Plutocracy kicked in and meritocracy kind of went out the window and then power kicked in and, you know, things got a bit bastardized. But essentially that's what government was. It was people coming together to form organized efforts to enhance the lives of, of the people that, that were under that government. Yeah. Um, and over time, it's kind of worked out a bit differently. And if you're down some rabbit holes, the, the Anunnaki, the, the reptilians, <laughs> and the cabal infiltrated government. And now the fifth frequency dimension reptilians are seeking to have the blood of the children. Which could be true. I don't know. But for me... <laughs> <laughs> It, it could be right. I'm not mocking it. It could exactly be what it is. That it could be what it is. It sounds like it comes right out of a science fiction novel. That's why I'm laughing. I mean, it's perfect. And, <laughs> and my thing is, is that I was one of my first teachers. He was like, it was all about the conspiracy stuff. He's like, um, well, yeah, they put it in the science fiction movies first so that when we tell you it, you don't believe us what, that we're telling you because you say that you saw it in the movie. Right, but right. they put it there. They put it there <laughs> as a, to throw you off guard. And I, I, I've seen enough evidence to think that that might be true, to be honest. But um, well, well, the model you just described um, is a model that political scientists have explored and, and debated. 
um, with varying results. Um, but when I look at that model, I say to myself, there's an interesting energetic side to that from an LOA perspective, because mm-hmm. people went into it with the idea, like you said, and I'm going to paraphrase that if they, they figured if they came together, they could, you know, weed out difficulties, correct imbalances, all that kind of stuff. And in, in their good intentions in doing that, they actually set themselves up for failure. Yeah. <laughs> Set themselves up for failure because they they bought into an assumption that wasn't true, and that is the only way they were going to get there is if they came together to do it. Mm. They forgot. So they created, or they, or they created they a false know. paradigm. Yeah, they they created a paradigm of lack. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm with you. And then that ends up being taken over by the reptilians. <laughs> the reptilians, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm serious about that one, by the way. Or am reptilians. I? Who knows. <laughs> I love it. I'll save my alien talk for a different show. But, um, <laughs> I'll have to do a whole show on that because that sounds like yeah, a but lot even, of Yeah, but even, I mean, I've got varying views on that. I, I mean, I, Zachariah Sitchin, Eric Von Daniken, not Eric, is it Eric Von Daniken? Um, those guys, anyway, they for me, put forward some very compelling evidence. And even when you look at some of the stuff that kind of gets pushed under the surface, there's a lot of evidence that we're not the only ones in the universe. And there's a lot of evidence that maybe there's more, they've got more to do with mankind than we've previously thought about. And even when you look at the ideas of the ideas of like the different gods that you find in different regions of the world, there are clear comparisons to other theories about the way things have happened over time i i I believe it's a possibility that what we call the gods as opposed to god the highest you know the the most high the divine such etc are advanced technologies that have had a, a stake in human development over time and there's i think enough evidence to at least explore that fully and there are a lot of people have taken that conversation somewhere oh yeah i just personally don't really care as long as I add to the world, have fun time. I've got a little human on the way as long as I create a loving boundary for with him, for him to explore his life and add to the world. That's what I really care about. Is that a Whether hint? Or not aliens do I know it's a him now? Oh, yeah, we've known for months. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, we've known you, for months. Have a name yeah. picked out? We're in deliberations in at deliberation. the moment. Okay. We're in okay. deliberations, but we've got a couple of months till, uh, till we... Till term. Need to, till term, yeah. So, right. Yeah. yeah mm. That's cool, though. That's really good. And yeah, ultimately, I think that's the bottom line. Um, mm. I, I mean, people get all worked up. We, we've, we've been kind of touching on dabbling on politics in kind of an irreverent way, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> as only we do it, Walt, as only, as we, do only it. we do it. <laughs> <laughs> that way we, we don't step on too many toes, too many different ways. <laughs> but, uh, it's great when you don't care what toes you step on as long as you do it in love. <laughs> it was done in love. Ta-da! It was done in love, right, yeah. <laughs> But the one thing that I, I always take away from this, and, and I take away this thought every time I think about the politics of a situation, is that no matter what people do, no matter how worked up they get, no matter how frustrated and angry they get, no matter how violent they get, no mm-hmm. matter what they do, no matter how they think about it, no matter how they end up going about it, they always come back to the same thing over and over and over again. And they're constantly faced with that same thing over and over and over again. And that is, I created this. And mm. and then most often, most people refuse to learn the lesson. And so they go through the next round and they do it again and again and again mm. and again. But what's cool to me, and this is why I'm bringing, bringing this up and why I mentioned before, I like watching the whole thing kind of falling apart. During mm. the falling apart phase, that's when you see certain individuals get it mm. and they kind of drop out of the game so to speak and they show up in other areas of life having dropped out of the game and that to me is fun because mm. that's seeing and observing somebody who is essentially turning their life around the way they mm. want it to be they're moving away from the thing they don't like and they're moving it toward the thing they do like and they're getting a different experience about it and mm. that's cool 
I like that. I like mm. that a lot. I like watching it. I like hearing the stories associated with it. You, I mean, you don't really find those stories too often if you go through the, the news media. You have to go through like alternative channels, so to speak. Mm-hmm, mm. But you can find them, and they're great. Mm. They're just great. Just little little rivulets, little little bubbles that pop up. All these these bits of change going on in people's thinking and thinkles. In thinkles? In thinkles processes. <laughs> thinkles. <laughs> thinkles, thinkles. In people's thinking processes. That's what I was combining two words together. It's great mm. to watch. And it's great to be a part of. It's great just to just see it all playing out. So people may sometimes be confused about my politics because I, I first of all, tend to stay away from it. And, and when I do bring it up, I tend to say things that try not to step on too many toes because I don't try to come from one viewpoint or another. I just like watching the whole thing. Hopefully this helps explain to people why I do that because there are great things that happen if you mm. just know where to look for them. That's my view. Mm. Um, any last thoughts before think, we sign off for the day? Uh, just don't get caught up in the aliens, guys, and don't <laughs> don't don't, don't take don't don't take big leaps when you can take small steps and enjoy the the river road the river ride. But um, which brings us right back to the first question: that ten dollars hasn't shown up. Yeah, so what? Uh, so there. Well, maybe there's something more, and it's actually that detachment from it needing to show up. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, literally, I had to reattach just to remember that it hadn't shown up in order to tell you <laughs> to get started. <laughs> because I didn't care; it didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when the fun just happens, you know. Maybe this adventure is. The, the 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 wonderful life of Walt Teeson and all the stuff that happens sometimes it doesn't happen other times. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Just have fun with it regardless of what shows up. All I know is I work as continuously as I can to get myself into the better feeling place and every time I do that I get better. I feel better. Mm. I enjoy more. I have better life. And that's a positive loop that's going to come back with more of that stuff to feel good about and more of that stuff to enjoy in that better life. But it is just enjoying the ride and taking it one day at a time, I think, anyway. And that's my view. Maybe you don't agree, and that's okay. I don't really care. It doesn't affect my life at all, whether you agree or not. Either way, my life's still going to be amazing. So, <laughs> you know, focus on your amazing life, and you should be a lot better, a lot better set. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, and you'll hear it again, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Well, once again, Daniel, thank you so much for all the wisdom. This is this is good. We haven't really gone, you know, deep philosophical, but that was good. I enjoyed that. Yeah, that was fun. That was fun. Really good. Definitely was. So, thank you, listeners, for tagging along. Hopefully, we didn't lose you along the way. Hopefully, you got some more. <laughs> That's part of the point. So, thank you very much. We'll see you all next time here on LOA today. Goodbye, everybody.